Welcome, Mindsetters, to this grade 12 science session. I'm here with my man, Phil. Phil, it's been a while since we actually kicked it, you know? I was your wingman then. Ish. Well, you left uh, me for a little while, but you're back, and I'm pretty happy point. about it. Yeah. All right, so Phil, actually tell us, fill us in what's happened today. Okay, we're going to be talking about some wave interference, and if we get mm. this right, uh, you guys can do some experiments at home with us online. We're not mm. sure. We're going to try and get that to work. Uh, we'll post up some links. There is a challenge question. And awesome. It's, once again, a very difficult one, okay? Ooh. I've been hard at work making this difficult, uh -huh. okay? So mindset is getting used to it, and you guys get pen and pencil and yeah. start working at it. Exactly. So, guys, you know the drill. I'm going to post up that, that, that challenge question soon, but you know, make sure you have your pens, your pads, your notepads, everything out. You're writing notes. You're making all those things because it's important. And, again, keep chatting on the page, www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra. Guys, make sure you chat, but for now... We'll see you after this break. Welcome back, Mindsetters, to the Great 12 session. Guys, I hope you're ready for this. Science, guys, it's... Oof. And I'm excited about this one because we've got like all these new like apps and stuff that we've put on using Google and all that kind of stuff and the internet and you know the interweb is so cool. So guys, make sure I'm going to post up some links so you guys can also check it out. But guys, again, as I always say, make sure you keep writing on the page, keep chatting to me. If you're lost anywhere, if you need help, make sure you hit me up so I can get those questions to fill. And I think, Phil, you ready to take it away from here? Absolutely, Ty. Oh, where? <laughs> oh, fantastic. Cool. Okay, right. Well, thanks for that, Ty. As I said, there's some really cool stuff I'd like you to check out on the web. We're going to try to see if we can get it on air, but that's something that's going to come up a little bit later on. That shouldn't stop you guys. There's a really fantastic link over here. You can go to a fantastic site which has been hosted by Colorado University. And what these guys have done is they've managed to figure out a whole bunch of experiments and make them virtual. So you guys can have an entire physics lab in your living room or wherever your computer is. Fantastic thing is if you can get to a computer with the internet, you have an entire physics and chemistry laboratory at your disposal. It's completely free. And if it's free, it's for me. And it's for you as well. Okay, so take a look at this website. Absolutely fantastic. There it is. It's P-H-E-T. So it's fet.colorado.edu. So that's edu forward slash en, forward slash simulation, forward slash wave interference. Now, that shouldn't stop you because there's a whole bunch of other ones that you should go take a look at. There's over a hundred simulations, a whole bunch of experiments you can play around. It's like a game. And these guys have been spending a lot of time trying to figure out how to make education interesting. And they've gone and taken some very difficult topics and they've made games where you can go and play and do your own experiments. The particular one that I want you to go take a look at, if you're studying tonight's uh, examination, what we're doing is we're talking about interference in waves. It's a pretty small section in the exam, but it's something which confuses everybody. And a lot of people are saying, well, that's the 10 marks I'm going to forget about. I don't want you to do that. One of the things that tonight's lesson is going to help is, especially if you were struggling, a lot of people were really struggling with this idea of Huygens' principle last week. We're going to be talking about interference of waves as they cross over each other. We're going to be talking about interference and that sort of stuff. A whole bunch of complicated words. Don't worry about it too much. Okay, well, let's get stuck into it. Let's start talking about interference in waves. So let's get right to it. Okay, this idea, interference. Now, most of you guys have in experienced interference before because interference happens to you at home. The dog is barking, your little sister's making a noise, the mother's making a whole bunch of noise inside the kitchen. Interference is when two things are happening at the same time. You're trying to think, they're trying to make noise, or they're trying to play outside, or there's a dog barking. Interference is what's happening when you've got two waves meeting at the same point. And I call this superposition. Now, superposition, I'm just going to highlight that word because it's really important that you know this. When they're marking your exams, they're looking for this particular word. Now, superposition. Now, superposition, there it is in yellow, nice and bright. And superposition just means that something has happened between these two waves. They have now combined at the same place. They have now met and they've agreed upon some sort of result. And what's happening is they're building a new wave. So interference, there it is. There's your word. It occurs when two waves are going to strike each other. Now, this might seem like a fairly sort of abstract concept, and a lot of people didn't really understand it in grade 10. The problem is it can rock up in your matric exam, and I've actually taken a question straight out of the November 2010 paper just to show you 
how confusing this can be, but it shouldn't be. You guys should relax, watch your questions. We're going to help you out. There's no problem. Okay? And once we've said that interference has taken place, I know that these waves are combining. They are in superposition. Superposition means that they have now combined at the same place. They're adding or subtracting from each other. But all you need to know is that interference is the result of two waves getting together at the same place. And that is what superposition is all about. Don't worry if you guys are scribbling down, writing down furiously. We do post these notes up online. You don't have to panic too much about it. Okay, so now, as promised, I've been thinking very, very hard, and I decided to come up with a challenge question which has never existed before. And I'm going to be putting it up on here. And I, I think Ty is busy posting it up on the web, and you guys are probably getting straight to it. And I'm going to put it up on the board here. Okay, now there's a guy who phones into YFM on a frequency of 92, uh, sorry, 99.2, and he said that he places his antenna a certain distance from a metal surface like his fridge. The signal goes dead, and he cannot hear the DJs anymore. How far is he from the fridge? Now, this is such a tricky one. Let me try to highlight some of the important information while you guys are busy taking this down. hope my producer is going to hold this up for a little while. I'm going to highlight this with you. So let's go through this. I know that this guy has phoned YFM. It doesn't really matter who it is, except that tells me the frequency of 99.2 megahertz. OK, so anyone wondering what that MHZ means, look on your radio. It's got there. If you're tuning into YFM at the moment or whatever, you should be watching us. But if you try and tune into YFM, 99.2 is a frequency to go to. And what you'll find is that you've got your units inside there, which is MHZ, megahertz. That's the first clue I'm giving you. OK, so something about frequency. He says that when he places his radio antenna a certain distance from a metal surface, OK? Now, just to give you some sort of idea, metal surfaces don't like taking radio waves in. There's another bit of a hint. OK? So like his fridge, the signal goes dead. OK, now that means that the signal itself is no longer being received. OK, that's quite important. So the signal becomes weaker. It goes dead. He can no longer hear the DJs anymore if he stands in a certain place. Now, you guys, have, you guys have done this. If you've ever spoken on a cell phone, and most of you have, if you're walking around with a cell phone, there's a certain place inside the house where everything just goes and all of a sudden your friend's sounding a little bit weird, this is exactly the same effect. If you move around, you will find that that signal improves in some places inside the house, and it gets worse in other places. Now, how far is he from the fridge? Now, you guys are going to get mad with your calculator skills. OK, so I've got a 99.2. That's megahertz. There's a frequency. I'm telling you that the signal goes there. I'm not telling you anything else. Now, you guys are going to have to do a little bit of research as to why a radio signal might be dead, or you're going to have to watch us and actually figure this out with us. I'm going to show you how. How far is he from the fridge? Now, I've given you a couple of options. 0.76 meters, or 1.5 meters, or 7.6 times 10 to the 5 meters, or 1.5 times 10 to the 6 meters. So there's option A, B, C, D. And I want you guys to explain. A lot of you guys just start guessing. Ty posts up the question. And you just get like a lot of people are saying, no, it's definitely D, no, it's C, it's B, whatever. I don't want you guys to guess. The really cool thing is, if you post that correct answer, and you start explaining, you guys start discussing, start using our Facebook page, and you start helping each other out. And then all of a sudden, you're going to start figuring out, ah, oh, one guy has actually got an idea. Go to him for some help. Maybe he can teach some of you. And I want you to try to figure out which one of these options is the correct one. Very difficult question. I've never seen one like this in your papers. But if you understand this, you understand interference. OK, so once again, I've got my frequency of my radio waves. And that's quite important. OK, now this is a radio. Just remember that radio signals are waves as well. And you see a certain distance from the metal surface. That's what I'm asking you to find. There's your options. I want you to calculate. Get out that calculator. Start drawing things. Start drawing diagrams. We're going to be back with you. And uh, we'll solve this a little bit later on. But let's get into the meat of this, this lesson. So I'm pretty sure that by now, Ty has worked hard. And he's posted it's up clear. question. It's up he, he tells me that it has been. You guys have got it. You've got everything you need. Fantastic. Let's carry on with the lesson. OK, well. Let's start playing around with this idea of when waves are in phase. Now, this is a word that some people have really struggled with. Okay, there's a lot of very complicated terminology, and people are saying, Ugh, take it away from me. Now, you don't need to be panicked when you start taking a look through this. I'm going to explain each one to you, and we're going to try to figure out what these words mean. Okay, 
Now, let's underline the difficult words and let's try to figure out what they mean. So it says, when waves are in phase. Now, when something is said to be in phase, now that's quite an important thing. In phase means that they are doing the same thing. Now, that's the basic idea behind this. Now, that means that they are the same parts on two different waves. And I'm going to show you on the picture. So they are doing the same thing. Now, if you are said to be in phase with somebody, let's say you're walking along, a bunch of friends and whatnot, and you start walking, and you start walking in phase, that means that your feet are moving in time with each other. If you guys are dancing in a line, your feet are moving in the same time. You are said to be in phase. You guys should be in phase with the music. The beat as well is a phase. So when your feet are touching the ground at that right time with the beat, what's happening is I'm in phase. Now, this is the next word. This is something that people struggle with. Now, I understand some of you said that the red is not so great on the page, so we're going to move to a different color. Okay, constructive interference. Now, I want you to start thinking about where you've heard this word, constructive. When your mother says, ah, oh, go do something constructive, that means that I must do something with my time which builds up my knowledge, which builds towards something good. Now, constructive interference means that waves are getting bigger than they were before. They are performing construction on top of each other. Now, construction builds something. Construction is definitely some sort of building. So that's what that word means. When I start to build the waves, that's what I'm talking about. Okay? So if I'm performing constructive interference, I'm building things. Let's look at this diagram. What I've decided to do is I decided to have a wave sum. I've taken a top wave, I've taken a bottom wave, and I'm going to add them together. I'm going to perform constructive interference. Now, this is a very confusing thing. I want people to see that these are two waves which must be existing at the same place at the same time. The hard thing about that is I can't actually draw them over each other because then they're going to look like the same wave. So there's wave one, wave two, and the result is a bigger wave as a result. Now, we know what two waves are going to make a, another wave is called. We call this a secondary wave. Two smaller waves are making a secondary wave over here. Let's find the pieces which are in phase. Now, if I take a look at some of the pieces on this wave, I might recognize them from grade 10. I've got a crest over there. There it is. Let's make sure that we can actually do this in the right color. There we go. Ah, there we go. Nice bright green. Okay, so I can see that a crest is going to be on top of a crest. And one thing on top of another, it's going to build up to something even better. So I've got one crest, another crest, and I've got a really big crest as a result. You can see that if I draw this from left to right, let's actually make it nice line as to where we were. There we go. You can see that that wave has gone from being very small to being quite large. I've taken two small waves and I've built it up. So what's happened is two crests have made an even bigger crest. So let's keep it in the same color. So what I'm finding is that constructive interference happened. So I've got constructive interference. I've made an even bigger wave than I did before. Now, it's like one guy pushing a hill of sand over another hill. What's going to happen is the hill in between is going to be much bigger. He's got to push it over that second hill. What about the bottom pieces? Let's take a look at that. Let's switch to yellow, and I want you to follow me to the bottom of the wave, right down in the bottom. Right down inside the bottom, I will find myself a trough. I've got a trough, and a trough makes an even bigger trough down at the bottom there. You can see that if I've got two of the same, this is what it means to be in phase. I've got two crests, two troughs, they're doing the same thing, they're working together. This is constructive interference, is when the two waves are working at the same time. So you guys dancing to the beat, that is constructive interference. So, if I've got parts of waves which are in phase, I say that they are constructively interfering. Okay, I hope everyone's managed to get that. I will come back to this in a moment. Uh, I'm sure that we're going to be posting some notes online, so if you're scribbling this down and you're not sure if any of this makes sense, don't worry too much. Okay, so let's carry on with this. Okay, what happens when these waves are not in phase? So in the last one, I said, okay, well, let's make the, the crests as green. There we go. We got green, but now here's the problem. I've got another crest, but you can see that the crests are not in the same place at the same time. What I find is I've got a crest, and I've got a trough, and they're doing opposite things. They're running in opposite direction. I'm so sure you guys know about that person that's not dancing in beat, and they're singing out of phase, and you can hear it doesn't sound very nice. They're said to have a flat voice. Well, this is going to make a flat wave. 
So if I've got two things which are doing the opposite, they're going to cancel out. One goes up, one goes down, they don't agree. What happens is exactly nothing. I actually find that the wave goes dead. There's your clue for your challenge question. Something is happening in the lines here. Let's look at the language. Okay, so now I can see that I've got something when waves are out of phase. There we go. Out of phase. There we go. Out of phase means that they're out of step with each other. They are not agreeing with each other. I can see that this wave is not in phase because I can see that the green doesn't line up with the green. Okay, and I find that green and yellow, they're going to cancel each other out. That's when I get destructive interference. So destructive interference is when I'm destroying. I'm breaking something down. If you're being destructive, you're breaking something. Okay, and over here, the waves are breaking each other. They're causing each other to cancel out. Now, what you'll find is that the place where this happens sometimes is called a node. So let's just make some notes as we go along. There we go. That thing, that place where the waves are canceling each other out, where there's destructive interference happening, I find that that region where destructive interference takes place is sometimes called a node. And a node is that point which is flat. So very often, you'd be looking for a node if you couldn't hear the radio. And there's another clue for that uh, earlier challenge question. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that people are going wild on the page, starting to discuss how to do this. I can see that Ty's shaking his head, and people are going mad on this page. That's fantastic. So you've got constructive, you've got destructive. We've already given you a little bit of a clue with this slide as to how to go about that question. All right, so when waves are out of phase, that means that they're out of step with each other. Destructive interference is happening. Okay, well, let's take a look. Let's summarize what constructive and destructive interference is all about. Uh, while we're waiting, there we go. We're nearly there. Let's just summarize this. I'm going to put this up on the page. So, just to summarize, destructive is when I cancel out. When I've got one going up, one going down, they cancel out, and I get no wave at all. Constructive is when I've got building up. They are in phase. I know that these two waves are doing exactly the same thing. So let's just highlight that. Let's just make sure that people understand this is out of phase. I'm just going to write this all nice and skew here. So out of phase. And I'm going to show you what that means in a moment. One of the really fancy gadgets that this board has got is I can allow two waves to move over each other. Now, constructive interference here, this is when waves are in phase. That means that they're talking to each other nicely. They are doing the same thing at the same time. When I say that you're on the same page, we are in phase with each other. So let's talk about out of phase, in phase, and let's actually start to go and see how this might happen. So what I've done is I've taken two of these waves down here at the bottom. Let's just extend this page. The really cool thing is I can move objects around on this board, and we can actually put these waves over each other. So I'm going to leave the one wave on the one side. Now, one of the really cool things that you can do is you can move these waves over each other. Now, I want to show you what I'm talking about. Now, when I've got one wave which is moving past another, something really interesting is happening. So I'm going to start moving it past, and you'll find that sometimes you've got waves which are crossing over each other. Now, the first time I do this, you can see that there are two crests which are meeting with each other. Superposition is happening. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a new wave. So if those two crests are crossing over each other, I'm going to do that again. And I'm going to draw in a new wave. I've got one crest and another crest, and they are meeting with each other. So I'm going to do that again very, very slowly. You can see this happening when two waves are approaching each other, and I'm going to get the left one to approach the right-hand one. I've got one crest, and it's coming towards the next crest. So I've got two crests above each other. What's going to happen is I'm going to get a brand new wave, and there it is. It's going, to be, it's going to be a really, really big wave. There we go. Let's draw it in for you. So I'm going to get a really massive wave. That's what I'm going to find actually happens. That's going to be my new secondary wave. I'm going to get a brand new, much bigger wave. Okay. Well, let's see what happens when I don't do that. Let's move that out of the way. Okay. Let's go back there. And let's see what happens when I move it a little bit further. I'm going to move this wave... And this is what I really like about this. I can see a crest and a trough are now meeting each other. What you're going to find is that when crests and troughs meet each other, let's actually do it completely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move these waves over each other, and you're actually going to see that there's going to be multiple overlaps. There it is. 
I'm actually going to see that I've got a crest and a trough, a crest and a trough. What I'm actually going to find is a brand new wave, which is going to be absolutely nothing. You're going to find that these guys are going to cancel out. They're going to make zero wave. There will be destructive interference. There it is. There's my new wave. There will be nothing as a result. That will be completely destructive interference. Okay, well, I hope that people are coping so far. What I think we should do is a short ad break. What do you think, Ty? I think that would work. Okay. Because I'm getting most of the comments on the page are, yo, what a question. <laughs> okay, well, it's a mean one. <laughs> yeah, it's a tough one, tough one. But guys, good things don't come easy all the time. So make sure you guys just keep working at it, keep working at it, and you will crack it. But for now, guys, we're going to take a little break. Make sure you go get something to eat. Just get a little snack. Make sure you're fueled up for the next round. And we'll see you after this break. Welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you've had a nice little break. You're ready to go. And I know a lot of you have been saying, oh my goodness, that challenge question. Woo, it's a tough one. I'm even looking, I'm like, hey, I'm okay. But you guys need to keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, keep working at it. Because guys, when you post your questions and all that stuff, those are notes for everyone else. So make sure you keep chatting on the page because it's for you. But for now, I'm going to pass it back to my man, Phil. Phil, take it away. Thank you so much, Ty. Okay, well, one of the really cool things you can see on the screen behind me, I'm sure my producer is going to put it up fairly soon, is one of those really great simulations. One of the cool things is, this is actually using a radio station with real radio waves. So what's happening is it's showing you how the waves are moving out into space and showing you how we actually work with this. So they've got a radio station which they're calling KFET and they're operating on 98.7 megahertz. And they're actually showing you how these waves are actually performing their job. So you can see the antenna, you can see the radio signal where it comes out. And you guys are actually receiving most of the signal directly from a satellite, which is doing it exactly the same way. So it's busy vibrating the electrical fields, and it's making these cool electromagnetic waves which are coming out. And one of the really nice things that we can do with simulations like this is we can actually play around with things like the frequency. We can start to play around with the wavelength. And we can actually start to see why we receive signals at a certain place. Now, on this side, I've got an antenna. This is a signal where a person is actually receiving it. Now you can see that the house on the right hand side has got an antenna and it's busy bobbling all the way up and down and this is where the wave is being received. Now you'll notice that sometimes the wave at the source, well actually almost all the time, that the source is always the strongest place for the wave. So what I'm finding is that I have a lot of wave when I start out but as it spreads out in a circle, we know that the wave is going to decrease and decrease and decrease in strength. So we can find that the wave is very, very weak up to this side. Now, you guys are watching us all around South Africa. A lot of guys from Limpopo, all over the place in Pumalanga. Now, you can imagine the size of an aerial which can stretch out a radio signal all the way out there is going to be very difficult. And this is why we use a satellite. So somebody asked, why do we talk about interference? Why is interference important? Okay, well, let's actually go back. And one of the biggest uses for constructive interference is actually this dish. You guys have seen this dish. Some of you are using this dish right now to see us. Constructive interference actually makes the signal stronger. Remember that this signal is going all the way from Randburg in Johannesburg, and it's being shot out into space, Okay, 100 kilometers straight up. And then what's going to happen is a, is a radio antenna is being picked up inside the satellite, and the satellite is going to amplify that signal. In other words, it's going to make it stronger and send it down to Earth. And most of the bottom part of Africa is actually being shone on by the same satellite. So you can imagine this radio signal from Randburg out to the whole of Africa is going to be quite weak. Now, you, can, you guys can see us. We are nice and bright in color. The only reason that we can do that is because of this amazing device. It's shaped a little bit like a salad bowl. It's nice and dish-shaped. Most of you have actually seen one of these things before. This really cool thing allows us to constructively interfere waves. So what happens is that these waves are coming from outer space, and we're going to find that these waves are going to be striking the satellite dish, and they're going to be received down at that bottom piece. Now, it's going to collect waves from all over. It's going to collect waves from a large area and reflect them all to the same place. So we're going to find that waves, no matter where they strike the dish, are always going to land up on that same spot. So I haven't drawn in the wavefronts because it gets a little bit messy, but I'm going to do that right down at the bottom. You guys might 
remember this from grade 10, but you didn't know that this was constructive interference. If I draw in a radio dish, I'm going to find that if I draw a concave reflector, I'm going to find that if I start sending waves, here's my incoming waves. That's not what I'm going to draw. What I am going to draw is what happens to them once they actually come off here. What I'm going to find is that I get these sort of curved waves, which are going to come to a point, and that's exactly where I want my aerial. It's a nice, strong area where I get lots of radio signal. I'm collecting lots of radio signal from a lot of places and putting it into one. Constructive interference is my friend when I'm trying to pick up a radio signal. Now, that's when I want a lot of waves. So I would like a lot of waves from space, from the satellite, to come to one tiny little place so you guys can watch TV. It's great. The problem is, sometimes I don't want waves. Okay, I'm sure you guys have got your favorite music artist, and they all, when they've made it big, they go into a recording studio. Now, one of the things that you do not want is you don't want waves to go out from the singer, from the instruments, to go out to the walls and come back again. So you're going to hear an echo. You don't want those waves. Now, even here in the studio, we've got separate things over here to try and decrease that. Now, that's to decrease the echo. That's to cause destructive interference. Now, I've gone and taken a picture of this particular foam that we've got here in the studio. It's very much like this. So destructive interference, I can decrease the amount of echo. You might notice this stuff on the inside of recording studios. We've got it on the inside of our studio here, and it's to decrease the amount of waves which are coming back. These special little shapes on the inside here are actually causing waves to go in all directions. And what happens is that this means that waves are going to be out of phase when they meet. We're not going to hear them, which is great because that means that destructive interference has helped us. So what you're going to find is that these shapes over there, we've got these, these outside shapes there. I keep on moving this around. There we go. So I've got these shapes over here. So if I bring this picture down here, you can see that these shapes are actually causing destructive interference. They're scattering the waves. The waves are going off in all directions. So if I draw this out here, I'm going to find that waves are no longer coming to a point. They're going off in all directions. So if all the waves are heading in all directions, they're never going to come back together to make constructive interference, which is great. And if I look past the camera here, which is shining on me, I can see that there's this foam coating the walls, and this is actually helping the clear sound inside the studio. You'll actually find that some of the foam on this microphone that I'm using at the moment as well has also got some of this foam on, and that is to cause destructive interference, to get rid of all those sounds that we really don't want. So now you know we're constructive. Interference is really, really useful. Destructive interference. Let's start taking a look at how we can actually picture what goes on when waves are crossing over each other. Now, a lot of you that were watching last week started to see what happens when waves were squeezed through a tiny opening inside a wall. Now, the waves initially go through, and because of Huygens' principle, they're going to spread out in new forms. So what we're going to find is that these waves are going to head out in all directions. Now, that's not what I'm looking for today. Now, what I am looking for is what happens when I've got two slits, when I've got two openings in the wall. I'd like to figure out what happens when those results, these new secondary waves, actually cross over each other. Now, if that all sounded like Greek and it was way too much to absorb, I've actually drawn out some pictures. We're going to take it slow. We're going to explain some of the difficult words. Don't worry about it. Let's try it out. OK, so all I need you to know is that when I squeeze a wave, through an opening, it's going to make a new wave, which is now round. It was straight, and now it's nice and semicircular. OK, Huygens' principle is the reason that that happens. If you haven't reached that section, don't worry about it. This is talking about interference through a single slit. Now, here's where it gets kind of tricky. Explaining Huygens' principle, remember, we needed to know that each point along here was acting as an individual source of disturbance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, well, if these were four stones all dropping into the, into the water at once, what's going to happen is they're going to create new waves. And there they are. So they should be coming up. There we go. Fantastic. So they're going to create their own brand new waves. Now, here's where you can use the information from last week to figure out what's going on here. These waves are going to cross over each other, and they're going to constructively and destructively interfere. That's the concept that I wanted you to figure out. I can figure out wherever there are points which are in phase, constructive will happen. Out of phase, destructive. OK, well, let's carry the concept a little bit further. And let's actually start talking about something which we did last week as well. 
This is called a secondary wavefront. This is the product of the constructive interference. This is something which we have already done before. So a secondary wavefront is that new shape, that round shape. Don't worry, if you're busy scribbling this down, don't panic. Those notes are going to go online in a nice PDF format, and we're going to figure out all the things that are going on inside here. So don't panic too much about that. If you're drawing, that's great. I want you to draw. Now, secondary wavefront is the product of those secondary wavelets. Now, how does this apply to two slits? I can just see one barrier. Now, the story is about to get a little bit more complicated. Now, I've got my two barriers over here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, well, through the one barrier, we're going to send through our waves. And we're going to create our new waves. And there they're appearing on your screen in front of you. So I've made some new waves. I sent waves through the one hole in the barrier. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to send another set of waves directly through the other side. OK, so let's do that. There they come. And that's fantastic. So what I've done is I've now created one set of waves and another set of waves. That's a very confusing picture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move it around slightly. So let's see. There we go. So I've definitely got two sets of waves there. There we go. Let's bring them back into line. The white set of waves and the yellow set of waves. Now they're crossing over each other. That's the tricky part. Now, any time two waves are going to cross paths, they're going to interfere with each other. There's going to be superposition. I want you to remember that word. It's the money word. It's the marks word. And it's the one which gets you through matric. OK, so superposition is when two things come together in terms of waves, they are going to interfere. Now, I can see a whole bunch of interesting things happening here. If you've ever seen one of these, or if you've downloaded the, the notes from last week, you've seen this pattern before. I can start to see that there are certain places where these waves are going to cross over each other. So I've got a place over there. Ah, oh, there we go. Well, let's do that again. Let's make sure that we've got a color. Let's actually do this in green. There we go. So everyone can see this. So I've got one place over there where they've crossed over each other. I do it again, and I do it again, and again, and again. And I actually start to notice something very cool. I start to notice that the same point on two waves is coming together. Not only that, they're doing it in a very nice straight line for me. Let's see if there's any other places where this might be happening. Well, I see it over there. And there we go. And when the, when the waves start coming back here, here we go. Let's just make sure that we've got the correct color pen. There we go. Again and again and again. There we go. And right down at the bottom here, we can start to see that pattern again. What we're starting to see is straight lines where constructive interference is starting to take place. That's really cool. Okay, I want to emphasize how amazing this is that it actually makes these really cool straight lines and you can see this. If you guys are playing around on FET, you can actually start seeing this in that wave interference program. Okay, so now that I've figured out that there's straight lines, who cares so what, what is the point? Okay, well, this is called the double slit diffraction. Now, when I start talking about diffraction of light, this is happening through two slits. So let's just give this a label and this is called double slit diffraction because there are two openings. There we go. So double slit diffraction. So now this is when I've got two slits and I'm performing diffraction because diffraction is from interference. So the diffraction of light happens through double slits in this way. I've got two sources of waves that are crossing over each other. Now I want you to think, when two things start crossing over each other, there are certain places where they actually match. That's where the interference is going to take place. This is an above view. And one of the really cool things that happens when you start doing this is you can actually start to see the results of this. So one of the really cool things, what I'm going to do, uh, there we go. Let's bring it up. Aha. Now what I've done is these green lines show exactly the same lines that we talked about earlier. These green lines are showing constructive interference. And if you project this onto a screen, if you try to show this on a screen, one of the really great things is you can actually start to see these produce light bands or bright bands. Now, this is where the exam questions come in. I start to talk about places where there is maximum brightness. Now, what I've done is I've drawn a graph in here. These green lines show you where the maximum brightness is going to take place. You can see that the middle one is the brightest. That is where constructive interference is taking place. There's places in between there which are not as bright, and those are where destructive interference. So there's my destructive band. That is a dark band. So destructive is where it's dark, and constructive is where it is light. 
And we seem to be doing quite well on the time here. I'm not sure how's the page going there, Ty. Everyone is still answering. I just told the guys, just make sure you're also putting how you got there because I'm getting Absolutely. last week's thing. A, no, it's B, no, it's C. I'm like, guys, come on, put your working there. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, Walter, guys, keep on asking the questions. I'm sure that there's one or two of you out there that have managed to solve this. Those of you that are guessing, we're not going to say yes to you because you aren't explaining yourself. Okay, because I want a full-on explanation. And this is also going to help nearly 10,000 mindsetters. Like I, I noticed the page is getting, getting on for 10,000. Yeah. So that's fantastic. You'd be helping all those people out there. Okay, so now that I've figured out where the destructive interference is taking place, the maximum brightness is where I've got constructive. And constructive interference is the stuff that I want if I want a light band. So if that is constructive, there it is. Okay, so constructive interference is where the maximum brightness is going to take place. Okay. Now, this all seems very, very complicated. A lot of people are saying, but how are we going to be asked this in an exam? I'm going to show you exactly how, because I'm going to bring up a question, question 7, out of the November 2010 paper. It was a mean question because nobody expected it, because they said, ah, oh, this stuff is grade 10 work. They didn't revise this for grade 12. So let's bring it up. And there is a lot of writing inside it, and I just want to make sure that people are okay with what's going on there. Let's figure out some of the factors which are going to affect this. Okay. Now, interference patterns like the one that we saw are going to help us answer that question. Now, there's some of the things that you can change about that interference pattern. So let's figure out what these factors are. Well, first of all, shorter wavelength. This means that I've got more interference. Why? Now, shorter, shorter wavelength. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that a shorter wavelength means that there are more waves in a small space. And a shorter wavelength is at a high frequency. Now, this is one of the problems that cell phones have got, is that because they operate at such a high frequency, there's a lot of places inside a building where interference can take place. Now, if you've ever been walking around in a cell phone and all of a sudden your friend sounds a little bit like <coughs> What's happening over there is that you've got interference happening on your cell phone signal. That high frequency means that there's lots of little places inside the building because of the way that the building is shaped that interference is taking place. Okay, that means that the bands are going to get smaller, everything's going to become more complex, I'm going to find that there's going to be more bands. Okay, one last thing before we get on to that question, as I said to you. Well, if I've got a further distance between the slits, I know that this results in a narrower band. So I find that the, the band itself gets smaller and smaller, that maximum gets closer and closer to the middle. So we, we're actually going to find more bands as well, so it might be worthwhile just putting in that extra note. I noticed that I've, I've got a larger distance between the slits. That means that they're going to cross over each other from a distance. That means that I'm going to get more bands as well. So if I've got more bands, that means that it's more complicated. OK, that's a very common question that we, we get in the studio here is how do you figure out how these two things? Now, the wavelength or the frequency. Now, remember, if you're playing around with FET, it's very nice to see the relationship between frequency and wavelength. They are inverse. High frequency means small wavelength. Very nice to know that, and I want you to play around with some of those programs. There's over 100 simulations there. Okay, so what we're going to do is I'm going to post up that question quickly, and I just want to get you guys exposed. Now, this is a very complicated question, a lot of writing going on. I just want you to show how they actually ask this in the exams. They talk to us about red light, which is passing through a double slit, and there is the pattern. This is directly as you'll see it in your metric final. Okay, don't worry too much about taking this all down. I think it's time for a short ad break before we head into the final stretch. What do you think, Ty? I think so, too. I think they need a little bit of a... <sighs> a little bit of a breather. To gain their composure, because it's still on the page, like, yo, this question. Yo, I'm seeing fire. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, People good. are trying. It means that you're at least trying and you're working hard at it. But, guys, all I can say is just keep cracking at it. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. But for now, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll see you soon. Welcome back, Mindsetters. I hope you've had a nice little break there and you're ready for this next session. And I hope, I hope all is going well with that challenge question because I'm still seeing people like, help, help. <laughs> but guys, keep working at it as I'm saying. You guys will get it. At the end of the show, we will go through the question. So Phil, ready for the next session? Absolutely, Ty. Aware. Okay. Phil, take it away. 
Okay, well, ta we're going to go quickly to this question from a past paper. Okay, it starts to talk about monochromatic red light. Now, people start figuring out. Now, there's so much information on here, and it's really tiny on your screen, so I'm going to guide you through it. Okay, monochromatic red light, that just means that it's only red light, one wavelength. It passes through a double slit, as shown in the diagram below. Circular wave fronts advancing towards the screen. Okay, whoa. Let's just take a little bit of a step back and figure out what they're saying. Okay. Now, a lot of people get lost in the words over here. You don't need to. Okay, all they're trying to say is that I've got my red light. Let's actually draw in red. My red light is going in through the bottom there, and it's heading outwards in all directions like we were showing earlier on. That's all that's happening over there. They're just showing you that the red light is coming through the slits down at the bottom, and they're heading out in different directions. So what they're showing you is that I've got the slits, and the solid lines represent crest. Now, that's quite important. So what I'm showing is that the solid lines represent crests and the dotted lines represent troughs. Let's do that in a different color. Okay. Now what I want you to see is that crests and troughs are going to be meeting at different places. So remember that. Solid lines are crests, dotted lines are troughs. That's all you need to know to answer this whole question. And we can start to figure out what P, Q, R, a whole bunch of things are. Okay. Now, it tells me that interference of the circular wave fronts results in an interference pattern observed on a screen. Now, the screen's right up at the top here. We've labeled it for you. I hope that you can see what we're talking about there. And uh, there's so much information. I try to make this as big as possible, but I wanted to leave it exactly the same way that you see it in exams, just to show you what it's like when you get to the end of the year. Okay. Now, this is exactly out of the November 2010, question 7. Okay, so November 2010, if you're practicing this, paper one. Okay, paper one is always your physics exam. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the questions that they start to ask me. Well, they want us to define interference for two marks. Okay, now they're looking for a couple of words over here. First of all, they'd like to know that two waves are going to pass over each other at the same point at the same time. We talked about this earlier. And another word, superposition. They need to know that there's two waves, they need to know that superposition is happening inside there. So I'm going to make some brief notes out of, over here. That is 7.1. Let's actually start talking about some of these answers there. Okay, so let's write them down as we go. So 7.1, okay, they need to know that there is superposition. That is absolutely important because there is a mark exactly assigned to that. I actually looked at the memo here. So superposition is one of the marks. They need to know that we've got two waves. You need to know that there are two waves at the same point, same time. Okay, that is very, very important. They need to know that they're passing over each other. So same point and same time. That means that they're existing in the same place. Okay, well, let's start taking a look what else they start to ask about. 7.2 says what type of interference takes place at point A? Let's go take a look at point A. Well, I can see that point A over here, if I take a look there, Let's just remind ourselves that point A is made up where there are two dotted lines, two of the same type. Now watch here. I'm going to put the dotted line as green. Remember that green was representing our troughs. So I have one trough over there, and I have another trough over there, and they are crossing over each other. So what I'm finding is that I've got a trough and a trough, and that is going to be constructive interference, two of the same type, happening at the same time, that means that I've got constructive interference taking place. And we are nearly at the end of this question, except there's one more. Okay, so let's write over there. Here we go. So I know that there is constructive, but they want to say, what is the reason? Remember that I've got a trough plus another trough. If it's two of the same, I'm going to find that there is going to be constructive interference. So this is a very shorthand way of talking about it, but I know that a trough plus a trough means that there are two things which are in phase. So I know that that is constructive. Fantastic. Okay, now for the kicker. It says, is band P a dark band or a red band? Okay, now dark band, remember, is where it is going to be destructive. Let's actually mark it off. So I need to know that a dark band would be destructive. Well, I want to know if P is destructive or constructive. Okay. Now, a red band. A red band is only going to be produced by constructive interference. Well, let's see which one it is. 
Let's see if this is a node or the opposite, which is called an anti-node. Sorry. Okay, so constructive. Okay, now I want to know if point P or band P over there, as they showed in the diagram. Let's see where P is. Ah, okay. Well, let's draw a line which is heading towards P. Let's do this. Ah, uh, there we go. Let's use a yellow pen on your hand. We haven't used yellow on this diagram yet. Okay. So let's use yellow to trace a line directly through to P. What I notice is that every point along here, when I start to talk about P, is I find that opposites are crossing over each other. I find that I've got a crest and a trough meeting all the way through there. You can see that dotted lines and solid lines are always meeting inside there. That can mean only one thing, that this line which I'm drawing is going to be a line of destructive interference. Let me show you again. I've got a solid line, I've got a dotted line all crossing inside there, all heading towards P. Let me actually get these drawings out of the way so that you can actually see for yourself. Now, if I start to take a look at the line which heads towards P, I know that every point along that line is where there's opposites meeting each other. I've got destructive interference happening at every point. So let's try and figure out how we get our three marks. Okay, well, we're going into it, and then we're going to leave a little bit of time for the challenge question at the end. So I know that it's going to be a dark line, but they want us to show why. I know that it's going to be destructive. And they need you to say that it's crests and troughs. That tells me why I'm getting destructive. Okay. So troughs and crests, there they are. That is the reason that I'm getting a dark line over there. There's my three marks all the way through. I hope that you've managed to cope with this. Uh, Ty, how's it going on the page there? Are people starting to near towards an answer? What do you think? Yes, yes. We've already got a couple of answers here. I've seen Solomon posted seeing a couple of other people who also posted Tebeletso. Where's, how did you get there? That's my question. I'm seeing other answers. Guys, how did you get there? That's the only thing. You need to post how you got there. I think, yeah, for, uh, besides that, I'm still waiting. Still waiting. Okay. Mm. Well, Tart, let's jump into the explanation and you can decide if you're right or wrong based on what we say in a moment. Okay. Well, first of all, we needed to collect our information. I had a frequency. So let's figure out what to do with that frequency. Now, here's the important part. I had F. Now, the fact that I told you that this was radio, radio waves, that's quite important because radio actually tells me what the speed of that wave is. That allows you to get a wavelength. Okay, now, what I'm going to do is let's make a little bit of space. Let's start working with the given information, and let's go for it. Okay. Well, before we get into it, here's one of the mistakes I bet some of you did. I know that the frequency was 99.2, okay? But remember that it's in megahertz. Mega means times 10 to the power of 6 hertz, okay? Now, I told you that there were radio waves, so I knew that the V is equal to a constant, which is called C, C is the speed of light. Now, you're saying, oh, well, it's radio and it's not the same as light. That's not true. They are all electromagnetic waves. That means that radio waves are also traveling at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Okay, well, we are nearly there. All we've got to do is figure out what the wavelength of the stuff is and try and figure out how to get destructive interference. So if I try to figure out that wavelength is equal to C over F. Now remember, I get that from C is equal to frequency lambda. That's an equation which is given to you a long, long time ago. So let's figure this out. Let's put in my C value. I say 3 times 10 to the 8. And over there, the frequency down at the bottom, 99.2 times 10 to the power of 6. I get a wavelength of around about 3,01 meters as my wavelength. That is my wavelength, but that's not my answer. That wasn't A, B, C, or D. Here's the difficult part. Here is the part that most people couldn't figure out. Well, when I start at my radio tower, okay, when I start at my radio tower over there, it's mm -hmm. emitting these waves. It's got to go there. It's got to bounce off this guy's fridge, and this is the hard part. And I know 
that the, it's got to interfere with the waves which are coming back. So the waves which are still coming here are going to interfere with the waves which are bouncing back. Which means that if it goes there and back, it must be half a wave out of time. Now that was the tricky part. I know that the waves which are coming in and the waves which are coming out, I must have crests meeting troughs. So there and back needs to be half a wave different. Okay, here's the problem again. Because it's going two ways, what I'm actually going to find is that the way to get destructive interference over here, and this one's quite difficult, you might not remember this from grade 11, is I've got to figure out what is a quarter of a wave. Because it's a quarter there and a quarter back. So if I find one quarter of a wavelength, I know that one quarter of 3.01 is going to equal around about 0.76 meters. And that is your answer. There we go. A is the answer for today's challenge question. Okay, really, really difficult. I'm just going to run through it again. I found my wavelength first. That wasn't too difficult. But figuring out that there must be a quarter of a wavelength in that echo, so a quarter there, a quarter back, that means that they are half a wave out of step with each other. Very, very difficult question. I've seen it asked in some of the IB questions, but I'm not sure that I've seen it in any of the government papers, but really, really nice question. Ty, how's it looking on the page there? Yes, we've got some A's. We've got some A's. Um, right now, I'm just looking at the names. Um, let me see who else got it, who else got it. In fact, for now, I think we'll just do a quick wrap-up. Absolutely. Let everybody know. Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of people are struggling to follow what's going on inside this example. I just wanted to elaborate on what was going on on the side. Okay, just quickly, if you're trying to figure out what's happening for destructive, a quarter there and a quarter back, that means that anything which is a quarter of a wavelength away is going to give you destructive. But I think that's around about it for today. Mm. What do you say, Ty? Yeah, I think that was a hardcore session there. Everyone seems to have liked it on the page. Good. And yeah, I'm seeing Solomon where they had already the A and everything. So he was good to go. So guys, I had fun. I hope you had fun. Make sure you always, always, always use the page. Chat, chat, chat. Invite your friends. Make sure you come to the page. And for me and Phil, we're saying peace out. See you next time. Bye.